Right, hi everyone, my name's Coove Shooten and I work at Southern Cross University in northern New South Wales, the home of flooding. I got here on my motorcycle, I didn't canoe here, believe it or not. Um, I work with an amazing team at SCU, uh, our research group's called Bees for Sustainable Livelihoods. Uh, and we work in the Indo-Pacific region and a lot of the projects are funded by the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, or ACR. And why is that important? Because these projects have been funding research in other countries. We've got a good understanding about the impacts of Varroa, how to identify it, how to monitor it, how to manage it, and that sort of thing. And some of the information gets fed into the National Beast Pest Surveillance Programs and that sort of thing. So that's me. Before I got a haircut, this is corporate coop now. Um, I'm going to be talking about Varroa mites today. Hopefully, we can. I know this is a, a not a great topic to be talking about. I'm a beekeeper myself, I run a small beekeeping business and I'm not that excited about this situation either. So today I'm going to be talking about what are they, uh, where did Varroa come from, what's the current situation in New South Wales, how does Varroa spread, what are the effects of Varroa on bees, what are some of the impacts it can have on beekeeping industries, pollination dependent horticultural industries and then there's some uh, recommendations at the end. So this is Coop in, the, uh, in my element. This is what I love doing. I w love working with um, poor beekeepers in developing countries. Uh, that's in Papua New Guinea there, some of the guys that I work with. And um, these programs are designed to uh, work on research questions that are of value to our beekeeping industry here in Australia and also these industries overseas. And it's also about growing capacity. So some of the stuff that we've been doing over there is about growing skills for our researchers here in Australia to be able to run tests to know what chemicals these bugs are being exposed to, their genetics, what country they come from, how to test for their viruses and things like that. And of course, managing varroa mites. So uh, in the programs that I run, I um, also work on research projects here in Australia, but this is one element of many um, that we work on. So uh, a core one is honeybee pests and diseases and biosecurity. So there are more than 40 different known honeybee pests and diseases globally. And as we know, with increasing trade, we've got more things moving around the world at a faster and faster rate. Uh, and that means we've got more and new uh, incursions of different exotic and pests and, and diseases. So this is obviously the one of interest today. This slide, uh, I, I don't have to convince people in the audience of this anymore, why it's important to study mites. So I only had to edit that first one. They're not here yet. Well, now that's just they're here. Um, another reason why it's good to study them is because they're actually difficult to study. They, they're not, they haven't been in Australia, so we have to leave the country to go and learn about these pests and diseases. Many of them exist in countries that, you know, they don't speak English isn't their first language and some of the research that's been done is excellent and it's in other languages. And obviously this is a tiny little bug that lives on a tiny little bug and yet the whole world knows about it. So obviously it's having big impacts on bees, beekeeping uh, industries, pollination dependent industries, people's livelihoods and it's also important to be able to go and do some of this research on mites for our capacity building. So what do we all know about varroa mites? What does Varroa look like? Well, don't ask one. They don't have eyes. Um, they're tiny little things. They're about the size of a sesame seed. They're really small. The male ones are a, a sort of translucent white colour and they never leave the cell. So every mite that you see that's brown is a female mite and it's already mated and it's already it has the potential to go on and start a new population. So with the current outbreak, we only have to miss one mite and it'll get a grip and start again. So every mite that's out there has the ability to reproduce and start a new population. Um, they're visible to the naked eye. You can see them, but they're very small, as you can see. So for beekeepers, you know, you need to have your, your spec savers on to be able to actually see these things. It's a trained eye to actually find them. So if you're an economist, that's how big they are. If they're a beekeeper, that's how big they are. If you're growing blueberries, that's how big they are. Where'd they come from? This varroa mite is uh, originally um, host to Apis serrana. So there are 11 different species of honeybees, not just Apis for the European honeybee. Uh, and it's originally the host of Apis serrana, the small Asian honeybee, which lives throughout Southeast Asia. And what happened is we put Apis mellifera in that area where these mites have um, you know, adapted to living on Apis serrana and it's done a host shift. It's jumped onto this other species. So Apis mellifera in its evolutionary history went off and did its own thing for quite a, a long time, like thousands of years. And so it didn't evolve the methods to deal with this mite, whereas some of these Asian species of mites uh, of bees did. 
And I hate to break it to you, but there's not just one species of Varroa, there's six. Uh, it's not good. Recently, uh, we've realised that Varroa Jacobsoni can actually reproduce on Apis mellifera. The one we have here in Australia is called Apis um, destructor. Under wood eye, you can find that in an Apis mellifera um, colony, but it's not reproducing on it. But that doesn't mean that it'll stay that way forever. So we can't, um, you know, like I was saying before with bioskew, these things, it's a changing dynamic all the time. So uh, Varroa destructor is the one that we know most about because it's in most developing countries. So that's a good thing. So where is it? I mean, this isn't a new bug. We've known about this for a really long time. So in 1904, it was first discovered in Indonesia. Um, after we put Apis mellifera into that area and then moved over and we found it um, reproducing in China, India, Brazil, Germany, the USA, uh, New Zealand, and then Hawaii. So there's two things that are wrong with this map. Uh, the first one is the fact that uh, it's, it's an old one, but they didn't do the literature research that shows all the good work we've been doing in the Indo-Pacific region. So if you Google some of the, um, the our understanding of mites surrounding Australia, we actually know more about it than that map shows. And the other thing is obviously that blue area that says no infestation. We've, we have that now. So um, as Rachel was saying before, there's um, now 30 or 43 infectious um, premises. There's been around 2,000 hives that have been euthanized. There's at least 12,000 bee colonies that are registered uh, within these eradication zones. Good thing is that they're mostly traced back to that original source. This is linked to an operation that, it, you know, beekeepers, we move things around. That's what we do for a business. So things have been moved around. It's mostly linked to that. So that's a good thing. Um, now, there's been some conversations around fipronil baiting. So you can attract honeybees to a sugar syrup feeding location and then lace it with fipronil, which is uh, it's going to kill all the bees when it takes it back. There's lots of challenges with this, and they are logistical challenges because you can't climb to the tops of mountains in the back of nowhere. They're literally, there's the, the actual area that we'd need to do is just a lot of resources. And also there are ecological challenges of literally putting lots of poison in the environment in terms of our native pollinators and that sort of thing. So lots of different challenges around that. Um, at the moment, if you've got 400, uh, 640 beehives or less and you're moving them onto pollination, you have to uh, test 64 of them. If it's more than that, you've got to sample for 10% of mites before you can move them and only through the blue zone. So in New South Wales, you can, we can get a permit to move bees if you do some varroa training through the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. You can get a permit. You, do, you show that you've done the sampling of at least 10% of your hives and then beekeepers can move their beehives. So how does Varroa spread? Well, these things are super nimble. They, 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 these little legs and they run around. I'll show you a video in a minute. Hopefully it works. More often they don't. They, so they can crawl around uh, really fast and they also drift. So up to 25% of any you know, bee population in a colony is actually not from that original colony. They drift and move all around a lot particularly if you put boxes right next to each other. The further they are away, the less drift you have. And the drone bees, which are the male bees, are twice as likely to drift. And these Varroa love drones. They, they are between, I think it's six and 12 times more likely to be found on drones than on the workers. Um, they also travel in swarms. So when colony bee colonies swarm, at least you know 25% of the Varroa population in there are going to bugger off with that swarm with it. So that's how they move around. And also through beekeeping activities. So obviously as beekeepers, we're selling queen bees. We're selling and moving nucleus colonies, which are baby bees. And we're moving beehives around the place for pollination services and for honey production. They can live for about seven days without any bees. So that means they can, you know, hypothetically jump off a bee on a flower, hang out, and then hitchhike to another bee colony on another bee. So this is a video of hitchhiking Varroa. They didn't call the article hitchhiking Varroa. And you can see it on the flower there. It's crawling up onto its back. And so that's just demonstrating that it can be done. That's in a lab, but... So now what do we know about Varroa? Well, we know what it looks like. We know where it came from. We know where it is. We know how it spreads. But what impact does Varroa have on bees? Depends what sort of bees you're talking about. Native bees is not going to be too much of an issue here. This Varroa mite, the biology and ecology of it is really closely linked to the ecology of our honeybees, namely Apis serrana, the small Asian honeybee, and European honeybee, or the Western honeybee, Apis mellifera. 
So it can't reproduce on our native bees. So it's not going to be too much of a problem. There are some studies that show that some of the viruses can actually spill over into other insect pollinator communities. And this happens not just from bees, but from other insects as well. The main one that we're worried about is the form wing virus. We don't think we have that in this incursion that's come through, which is really good news. And I'll explain more about viruses in a minute. So it's possible for virus spillover. The impact's probably not very, not going to be that great. Um, and it's actually possible that because the impact that varroa is going to have on some of the feral honeybee populations, there may be less competition for these native bees in their natural environments. So for honeybees, how do these mites impact on them? So what they're doing is they're basically feeding on the brood, they're, they're chewing on the pupae as it's developing, they're spreading viruses, uh, makes them really deformed and weak, they don't live as long, and then the adult bees can't fly and collect resources, the population declines, honey production drops, uh, their health declines and the colonies die. So this is a video of, of varroa, and you can only guess how many uh, flowers that bee is going to be visiting. It's a really si sad sight for beekeepers, opening your hives and looking at your brood chamber, which is where all the baby bees are being born, and the brood patterns are just looking terrible. They look like they've been shot with a shotgun. You can see a little white, that's a uh, juta nymph, you don't need to know that, but there's a juta nymph, which is a, it's actually a female one down there, so that'll die because its exoskeleton hasn't developed properly, and it'll probably desiccate. So there are lots of viruses of honeybees. We'd know about 18, they're probably, if there's, I'm not a specialist in honeybee viruses, we have John Roberts at the CSIRO, he is, I tell you that there's probably a lot more, they just don't have names, but these are some of the main ones that we know of that impact on bees around the world. The seven there that are in red that are some of the, the worst ones. And the ones that I've got asterisks next to, they're the ones that we have here in Australia. And these mites are going to be spreading these viruses around. One of the worst ones in the world that's been associated with major colony losses globally is deformed wing virus. So we're really hoping we don't have that. So you don't have to read all that. Oh, I've done the reading for you. This is just a bit of a literature review. So just so you know, the next points I'm going to show you come from all these papers that I've summarised for you during my free time. So the effects of varroa on honeybees. Um, they spread, activate and exacerbate viral infections. There's three different things going on there with those viruses. They create physio physiological deformities. So you could imagine, th these mites, they're really small, right? But in com they're one of the largest uh, ectoparasitic mites relative to their host in the world. It'd be like me having like a, you know, like a plate-sized tick on me. Imagine if I was a baby. That's not good news. So you could imagine when these things are actually physically biting them, if it's an antenna, they, there's an antenna actually really important to a bee. <laughs> it helps them, you know, do lots of things. If it's an eye or a leg, you know, they, these, so they get bitten and it deforms their bodies. They have a significantly reduced life expectancy. They don't live as long, so the population declines. It reduces the fat body tissue. These are insects, they don't have a liver. The fat body is their liver, so that means they, they are much more susceptible to pesticides. They have a diminished immune response, so they're more susceptible to other diseases. They have a reduced weight and size. Uh, reduced sperm uh, in the drone uh, populations and flight performance. They have impaired flying uh, abilities. It affects their ability to learn. Bees are incredibly smart. They can actually solve really complex things. Um, and they have small, smaller hyperpharyngeal glands and royal jelly is really important to bees and also their mandibular glands. They don't talk. They use pheromones to communicate. They, they're social organisms. They interact in, in a super, they're a super organism. This is how they communicate. The pheromones are really important to their communication. But the effects of varroa on individual bees cannot necessarily be directly translated to the health of a colony. Uh, it doesn't work, it's not that simple. So the effects on honeybee colonies uh, more broadly, the research shows that these colonies become much smaller. They're not collecting as much resources. They don't have as much honey, they don't have as much pollen, and that's their main food sources that keeps them healthy, um, and there's less bees in there. They exacerbate spread of disease, not between just bees, but also between different colonies. They're much more likely to die. That means if they have American fowl brew disease, which is a fatal disease of honeybees, can't, there's no treatment for it. 
then it'll, if that colony dies, it'll spread and exacerbate other pests and diseases in the apiary. A large population of the workers are inactive. They're just hanging around. They're not feeling too well. Um, it, there's significantly higher rates of uh, queen supersedure. And we describe a bee colony it, when it's got very high numbers of varroa mites as having parasitic mite syndrome, which is characterised by having low bee population, patchy brood and, and crippled bees and this um, decaying larva. Some of the effects on beekeeping businesses. So one of the main things that this is going to do for beekeeping businesses is it's going to really increase your costs of production, namely because of labour because you have to go out there and monitor how many mites you have in the hive. Now, where are all these beekeepers' hives? They're not just at home. They're, they're distributed all over the place. It costs a lot of money. Has anyone been to a petrol bowser lately? <laughs> I have. <laughs> it's very expensive to get around. It's going to increase your cost to get out there. You've got to go out there more than two or three times extra per apiary. It's a lot of travel. In New Zealand, most beekeeping operations had to employ an additional staff member whilst reducing the number of colonies they had just to monitor for these and manage these different mites. Um, so lots, lots of increased labour. Uh, in New Zealand, the experience was about $40 to $50 dollars per colony, So, and that study was in 2008. So in today, with inflation, I've calculated that's about 53 to 66 bucks per colony increase in 22 figures. For the Australian-sized uh, beekeeping business in Australia, if you can get an average from the views, it could potentially increase business costs by 30%. And that's coming, there's a study, a full study, if you want to go and check that out, I can send you them if you email me. Um, in New Zealand, it's costing about, that study was done in 2014, it was about $12 million just for the miticide treatments alone. So let's say 15 million bucks a year just on, on, on the miticides. Um, in New Zealand, there was a 50% reduction, and in America, there was a 60% reduction in the number of hobbyists and part-time commercial beekeepers, like me. 50% of them disappeared. So this is too much. I can't do this. It's just too much effort. It's too sad <laughs> seeing your bees dying like that all the time, and having to put chemicals in the hive. Our recreational beekeeping industry is actually important to the rest of the beekeeping industry in lots of ways. They're worth about $173 million to the Australian economy. Uh, and interestingly, when I was reviewing the literature on this, the impacts on honey production are actually pretty difficult to discern. So if you look at the production in any crop or in any livestock and crop production system, the, the determinants influencing production are very, there's so many different variables, your pests and diseases, nutrition, genetics. And so it's actually pretty hard to correlate the number of mites in a hive to production. It's actually pretty hard to do. So there's some studies that show that when you've got, when varroa mite turns up, you have significant declines in honey production across the sector. And in some countries, you see actually there's not that much of a difference. Effects on the bee industry. So this, uh, we can't really emphasize this enough. You know, this is a leading cause of colony mortality in the United States. They lose about 40 to 45% of their hives every year to this bug. Interestingly, in New Zealand, they estimate they lose about 12 to 13 percent of their colonies each year, and around three percent of them are, are um, attributed to having varroa mites. New Zealand's got pretty different uh, climate to most of Australia as well, though. I've got to stress too that management options cannot eliminate varroa mites. We do not have a treatment that gets rid of all of the varroa mites. You can use miticides that are highly effective. But like anything, they need to be used sparingly. It's a tool as a part of an integrated pest management strategy. And that's idealistic in lots of ways because we want to be doing that. But it can also be very difficult to do that because of the costs associated with it, actually going out there to do those sorts of things. Um, so we can't eliminate it. We can only manage it below economic thresholds. In New Zealand, uh, the, the research was showing there that the hive numbers actually remain pretty steady. So they got New Zealand got Varroa in the year 2000. But the number of registered bee businesses halved. Uh, and they've seen about a 2% decline in New Zealand. And there's little change in the number of hives in the USA. But so I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm looking at you all going, wait, so there's varroa mite here, but you're saying that the impacts on honey production may not be that major? And the number of hives might remain around the same? Is that what we're saying? That is kind of what I'm saying. That's what the literature is telling me anyway from what I've been reading. So why might that be the case? It's a really common misunderstanding for lots of people around the world in terms of the, the Save the Bees movement, in terms of the number of bee colonies has actually been increasing around the world. Believe it or not, beekeepers are really good at making bees. 
Surprise, surprise. So if I'm going to lose 10% of my bee colonies this year, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to plan for that and I'm going to make 10 nukes and I'm going to make sure that I have the same number. So beekeepers are really good at actually replacing their losses and they will do this. I know they will do this. <laughs> they might reduce it a bit, but they will have significantly increased costs to do that. It's going to cost them a lot more to maintain all the resources, all the time that goes and the risk that goes into maintaining the same number of colonies is going to go up. Uh, another reason why a number of hives might not go down as much while the number of beekeepers do is because the majority of the beehives in the country are owned by a very small percentage of beekeepers. Uh, really important commercial beekeeping operations around the country. Some of the indirect challenges of varroa mites. So uh, we, the, this is more broadly within the beekeeping industry to be supported, but access to floral resources is really important to beekeepers. Without access, you know, not all trees are of equal value to bees, as we know, um, and beekeepers having access to different floral resources is really, really critical to, for them being actually able to be able to provide you with a service that meets the standard, really good, healthy, strong bee colonies. Um, so if anyone's read the latest um, State of the Environment report, it's probably not that alarming because it's been, this trend's been increasing, but we've been clearing a lot of native forest in this country for a long time. There are other pests and diseases, and I've also highlighted exotics. So there's a little bit of bad news at the end of this bad news story. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight some of them too, because it's not just the end, just now that we've got Varroa, we can just give up on our biosecurity programs. We've got an ageing industry, believe it or not, I'm actually 65, I just eat a lot of honey. <laughs> Steve's 200. Um, and interestingly also, if you look at other industries, what happened in these other countries when they got Varroa? What happened to New Zealand and the market there? After 2000, if you look at their exports and the money coming in to beekeepers' in pockets because of the manuka boom, because they had amazing marketing strategies, their income went like this. Are we going to see a similar situation? In America, they had an amazing boom in the horticultural sectors. That influenced beekeepers as well. So there's other things that are going on. We can't just assume that things are going to play out the same way as in other countries. Effects on uh, pollination industry. So as we know, 65% of horticultural crops require honeybees. It's about $14.2 billion contributions to the Australian economy. Interestingly, same with this honey production situation, when I was looking at the literature, there are actually very few studies that can pinpoint varroa as being the, the lead determinant of the effectiveness of pollination. So there's actually not a lot of studies that are out there. This was one of the studies that I did find. It actually showed that um, colonies that have high levels of mites are less effective pollinators, possibly due because they have shorter flower visitations and lower tendency to collect pollen. They have recruiting more nectar foragers. That's one study. Whenever you find something out in life once, <laughs> try and replicate it. So feel free to check that article out, but um, obviously more needs to be done in this space. It represents an opportunity for us to better understand what's going on. One thing that we do know that's pretty clear is that we're gonna lose about 95% of our feral bee population. I've seen this time and time again in a number of other countries for anecdotally from um, horticulturalists saying we don't have any bees pollinating our crops and they were relying on feral bees that were in that area. We know that this will happen, this has happened in other countries and it'll take about three to four years for the feral bees to be um, hit by this. Our bees here in Australia do not know how to deal with this problem. They have never been exposed to this bug. So they're very naive about it. It's gonna take them time to learn how to deal with it. So therefore, that's going to increase the number of pollination, uh, pollinator hives that are required because you don't have the feral bee populations that are actually providing a free service. So if you needed you know, two colonies per hectare, you might need three because you're trying to replace what's been lost. Um, there'd be a greater number of potentially marginal pollination industries seeking bees. So the moment they're getting services from some of the feral bees, but now they won't be, won't be there, so they'll need to get bees in. So there'll be more people wanting bees. There's possibly, you know, obviously there's going to be a greater demand and a lower supply as beekeepers adapt to this and do lose colonies and, and change their businesses to respond. So that's going to increase the direct costs of pollination services. And the price per beekeeping, uh, per hive, um, there was a study in 2007 by Cook that estimated that if, if we got varroa here in Australia, an increase by $70 to $110. So in today's figures, that's about 103 bucks to 160 bucks on top. 
in New Zealand, the experience there was in the first five years, the cost per hive went up by about 30 to 100 percent. So see some of the um, words of wisdom at the end, so let's take these with a grain of salt. Um, encouraging on-farm floral um, biodiversity, so for, uh, so for some of our native pollinators is going to be really important, and that can support our honeybees as well because we're going to make sure that they've got access to good nutrition. Um, growers using pollination contracts, I don't need to speak more of that because Steve did already, but just making sure that we've got, you know, people that are doing the right thing we don't want to be spreading viruses around the place and more of these viral mites around the place any sooner than we have to just making sure that we use um, best practice increased research and development into bee biosecurity um, impacts of viral management and, and optimizing pollination services working closely together with the different sectors is going to be really important for um, improving business and continuity planning because there's going to be increased costs for both beekeeping and horticultural industry so how do we respond to that and the last thing I wanted to mention too is that I don't think that we need to lose faith in the programs in terms of biosecurity um, that are out there. I think that actually represents an opportunity to improve because these are a lot of the pesticides we don't have yet, which is a really good thing. Woo um, some of these bugs here are terrible and the world's not really talking about them in lots of ways. You might say, oh, well, we just talked about Varol, but I remember there's six species of them. We don't want the other five. Remember all those viruses? We don't want all those other viruses, trust me. You've heard about how bad they can be. That, that bee down the bottom there, Afri Africanized bee, they are so aggressive, they'll chase everyone off your farm if we get them. Good beekeepers, even like Steve, will have to wear gloves. He never wears gloves. <laughs> the top right there, Tropolalaps. I've done quite a lot of work with this. This might only exist in low and uh, developing countries, so no one knows anything about it. This is a, this is a quick video of uh, Tropolalaps mites, just so that you know. These bugs, they breed twice as fast and they can transmit viruses just like Varroa. We don't want to have these in here. So that doesn't mean we give up on our national pest surveillance programs. We need to learn what happened, learn how we responded, make sure that we're better prepared going forward as well. So I'll stop chewing your ear off about Varroa mites and I'm happy to hand the mic over to you guys and hopefully we can answer any questions. Thanks everyone for having me and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Yeah, is it first place? First place is Demetrio Bruno. <laughs> and in second place we have Saga Roja. And in third place, we have Catherine Nitz. <laughs> and if you want to make your way to the registration, you can pick up your prizes. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> okay, time for Q&A. Have we got Sorry. the special talking cube? Someone's got to take it. Rachel's uh, on the on the stand. Hello, here we go. Thanks. Um, question question for Cooper. Based on your understanding of the of the mite and um, the the spread or the incursion and what we know about it to date, what's your best guess at the likelihood of success of the eradication efforts? Do we have a sitting down microphone? I'm, I'm happy to get up. So the question was, what are the chances we're going to eradicate this? 
Look, I could give you a really diplomatic answer, um, but no, I won't. I won't do that to you. I'm an academic. I look. I've seen this play out in other countries, and we have to understand that this might exist in every other country for a reason. It has an amazing strategies of reproducing and spreading. Um, I really hope we can. I'm a beekeeper. I really hope that we can get this under control. I think that the distribution at the moment, um, there's a lot of challenges, and as I said, you only need one to get out. I think that there's a really good opportunity to slow its spread, and I think that the industry needs support to be able to learn to manage this pest problem. And uh, the sooner that we do that, the better, because um, we'll be able to keep healthier, happy bees and make sure that they're there for you guys. Does that answer that question? On your slide in the US, it said the bee population hasn't sort of decreased as much compared to New Zealand. Why is that? All right. So is this is this on? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the bee populations there have been declining, and the the bees are the numbers, the total numbers of deaths are increasing. Right. So, but what's happening is the beekeepers are replacing them faster than they are declining. Does that make sense? So this. The varroa is killing a lot of bees, more bees than it ever has. And it will kill a lot more bees in Australia than what we're losing now. But what will happen is beekeepers will have to work harder, spend more money, more time, more effort, more learning, more risk around you know, providing a healthy product and around providing healthy, happy, strong bee colonies. use one of these. Um, you might have mentioned I missed half the presentation, sorry, um, but uh, will this have an impact on the, uh, in Tasmania we've got a um, population of bumblebees, the, the, so the, um, what am I thinking of? Yeah, is that going to have effect there in the, on those? On Tasmania? Well, when it, if it gets um, to bumblebees? There. Yeah, yeah. No, this is, it's, so Vra was more an apiarist um, genus. Um, pest, so bumblebees, it won't affect the bumblebees at this point in time. Also, you are lucky in Tasmania because you've got a great a body of water between us, so um, that's going to be a saviour as well. Yep, I, I totally agree with what Steve said. Um, there are studies that show that um, some of the viruses can spill over specifically to bumblebees. And there's some papers, if you put into Google Scholar, in what happened in New Zealand is a unique situation there. But at the moment, we're under the impression that we don't have any of those viruses that are going to potentially be an impact. And as Steve said, really good opportunity for Western Australia and with that big Simpson Desert and um, that big stretch of water down between us on the mainland in Tasmania to keep it out. Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, I was just wondering, is it possible to, or is anyone trying to breed resistance in bees, or is that not a possibility? Varroa resistance? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we wish we could breed that into the bees. Um, it's because they, feed, they actually feed on the, the fat and not um, most probably in, into the blood. That's why we can't do it that way. Um, yeah, that's most probably the hardest part of it, breeding it in. We do have some queens that are being bred at the moment and it's um, um, rural resistance breeding that they're going through. It's, it's a um, slow study we have. We do have Plan B happening here in Australia as well. So what we're finding is it's not a varroa resistance that they're breeding, it's a, a hygienic that we're trying. So the bees clean themselves more and that way they knock the, the mite off themselves. So we're going that line of hygienic instead of actually resistance. Oh. Yep. Um, I f uh, found that really fascinating, the presentation. Um, you alluded to the, the fact that apiarists have got to work a bit harder now to, to keep up with bee populations, but also the loss of feral bee populations around. I was just wondering how well industry is situated to, to increase that capacity. 
Um, this is something new to us as an industry. We are struggling at the moment with resources, especially in New South Wales. Um, there's no use having hundreds of thousands of hives when you don't have the resources to keep them alive. So that's the other struggle we're having as well. Um, as Cooper said, and I'll take it as a pun that I'm 200 years old, I wish I was, <laughs> um, our beekeepers are an ageing population. Uh, we need to get a lot of young blood into the industry. Uh, it's an industry that, in my eyes, is very beneficial and it um, has a lot to offer. So if we had younger beekeepers coming up, possibly then we can offset the loss of hives by more beekeepers. And if we've got more resources, then we can house more bees. So that's the two areas that we're working on. Steve, can I just... I guess I just... The resources is uh, like state forests, national parks and other places like that. So it's bees to build bees, we need pollen and we need nectar. So sometimes like we might come to you as you may have a larger farm and we might be able to use your area to build our bees and then move from that farm to another farm. But at this point in time we're using a lot of state forests and a lot of national parks. I'm just going to throw a little thing in. Imagine now if foot and mouth hits to Australia. That shuts us out of all private lands in New South Wales or within Australia. Our resources goes from very large to very, very small. Then we go to supplementary feeding. That's really hard. Another added cost. Yeah, I've got another question. Um, so you were saying that the varroa mites coming from uh, Asia initially and that some of the bees in, in that region of the world seem to be a little bit more tolerant of it. Do any beekeepers in Australia have, I guess, some of those genetics and, and breed hives of, of, of that species of bee? Like, is that something that could be increased as part of the industry? Okay, when, you, um, when you're breeding for varroa resistance or along those lines, you need varroa here so that we can test it. And Dr Cooper said that before. Because we haven't had this here, we haven't had the opportunity to do research on it. So that area where behind the eight ball, we're trying to get like onto research that's overseas, that's going to give us our study here, and then we can like utilise it here in Australia. Yeah. Just about bee breeding for varroa colonies. No, no, it's more about yeah, having the bees here. Can we breed it up? Can we do research? I don't know if I if we could get that that microphone turned up. I have really bad hearing. I, my, my bad. I think the question was related to varroa tolerance breeding stock here in Australia. Can we improve it? Yeah. Sorry if I've missed the question. So, yeah, so um, we've had actually had some recent invitations. So because our Australian honeybees haven't had exposure to these mites, like Steve has said, um, they don't have that, you know, ability to withstand them. In other countries, for example in Russia, there's a longest living population of bees that have been exposed to these mites. So some of the genetics there um, have, that bees have lots of different mechanisms that they can implement to actually try to deal with varroa. Part of it is grooming themselves, so grooming behaviour. Some of it is that they can detect the pheromone inside the cells and detect that there's a varroa mite in there. There's lots of different strategies that can actually be put in place um, to actually, you know, improve hygienic behaviour, like Steve was saying. But it's going to take time, and it needs to be under selective pressures. So we need to have a varroa mite population established within some of our really highly performing bee breeding operations to be able to improve the stock. And part of the challenge is, even though some of the genetics in Russia, for example, might have developed this over time, we can't just import that semen here that easy because even semen is not panacea because there are what? Viruses. And we don't want to import them. So that can be a biosecurity challenge. Any other questions before we finish up this session? Just um, one other thing I want to bring up. In the talk there, there was about having a permit for beekeepers to move. As growers 
and landholders. If you allow a beekeeper to go onto your property without that permit, you are liable too. The first fine is $1.1 million. For a corporate, it's $2.2 million. So if you ask a beekeeper to come in in New South Wales and you don't have that permit, you are liable as well. So it's a two-way street here, guys. So I think the message is um, stay tuned. We will tell you what the rules are. We will work really hard to enable pollination to occur if we can. Um, but, you know, the fines are significant if you do the wrong thing. So make sure that you um, check that the beekeepers that you're working with do have the appropriate permits. Um, I'd just like to say a very big thank you to Dr Cooper Shooton and to Steve, who've come specially here to talk to us about that. It was a fascinating presentation. I learned a lot. Um, and, you know, we really appreciated your time and energy today. So thank you very much. <laughs>